Hey, good afternoon. My name is Antonio Martez, and I'm with Health and Wellness Assistant Co-Chair of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, and we are so happy that you're here with us today. We are about to have a discussion on the effects of COVID and um, virtual learning. And with us today is the distinguished doctor, Dr. Marcelin Jurgen Alsop. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about uh, Dr. Al Jurgen Alsop, she's a developmental pediatrician and the senior medical officer of the human disability of the National Center for Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities in the Centers for D Disease Con Control and Prevention. After coming to the CDC in 1984, she designed and implemented the first US population-based study of developmental dis disabilities among children. This led to the formation of the CDC Autism and Developmental Disparities Monitoring Network. This network has been tracking the number and characteristics of children with autism spectrum disorders and other developmental dis disabilities in the US since the year 2000. She served in the medical dir uh, director at Clayton Early Intervention Program in, uh, uh, up until, in Atlanta up until about 2013. Dr. Jurgen Alsop received her medical degree from Emory University and is a board certified in pediatric, uh, pediatrics and neurodevelopmental disabilities. She is committed to making an impact on the lives of children in, the, in all ability levels. Just a couple of things that she's gonna go in and, and, and discuss with us. Um, you know, being a father of two, um, a 16 year old and a nine, six year old son and a nine year old daughter, this, this topic definitely weighs heavily on me. She's gonna discuss the sudden shift from in-person to virtual learning and, bound to, and how it affects children in different ways. And as parents, we may see the children's levels of focus, attention spans, and level of commitment to schoolwork. It is also important to consider how children of different ability levels will respond and adjust to the changes that they have experienced in the result of this pandemic. Virtual learning has not been a one size fits all, as we all know, um, because children definitely have different learning styles. Uh, one size fits all for a method of education. Different children respond differently and may experience different levels of support and a success depending on that, um, virtual learning and how it has impacted them. So Dr. Jurgen also, we are very pleased and very happy to have you here today and look for, very forward to your discussion. Take it away. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I don't have the slides up quite yet, so. Can we go ahead and get the slides up, please? While we do that, uh, Dr. Jurgen Alsop, um, if you want to expound on, on what you're going to present, um, that'll be great just for our audience. Um, you know, while the team go ahead and gets the slides up. Okay, that would be great. So I'm going to present on African-American parents of children with special health care needs and COVID-19. And it's necessary for me to let you know that I have nothing to disclose. So we know that COVID-19 has affected all of us. It's affected us as adults. It certainly has affected our children. And we are particularly concerned about children with developmental disabilities and children with special health care needs and how they've been affected by the pandemic. So I'm going to talk about, first of all, um, next slide, please. I'm going to present some terminology. Next slide so that we're all on the same page when I talk about, for example, developmental disabilities. I'm also going to talk about the prevalence of developmental disabilities, the increased community challenges of children and youth with special health care needs, the impact of COVID on children and young people, how we support families, and then I'm going to summarize. Next slide, please. So next slide, who are children and youth with special health care needs? What do I mean when I refer to that group of children? 
So the definition is those who have or are at risk for chronic physical, developmental, behavioral or emotional conditions, and who also require health and related services of a type or amount beyond that required by children generally. Next slide. What are developmental disabilities? Another term that I'm using. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about four common developmental dis disabilities, just so we can be on the same page. So the first is autism spectrum disorder. And I know that everyone's heard a lot about autism. So the definition is autism or ASD refers to impairments in social interaction and social communication, along with restricted interests and repetitive behaviors. Cerebral palsy is the most common motor disability in childhood and is defined as a group of disorders that affect a person's ability to move and maintain balance and posture. Intellectual disability should be identified by before age 18, and it refers to significant limitations in both intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior, which includes daily social and practical skills. And ADHD, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, is the most common neurodevelopmental disorder of childhood. It usually is identified first in childhood, but we now know that it often lasts until adulthood. Children with ADHD may have trouble paying attention, they may have impulsive behaviors, or they may also uh, be overly active. Next slide, please. Next slide. So here is a slide that talks about the intersection of disabilities and special health care needs. Now, although people with disabilities or children with disabilities are sometimes referred to as a single population, this is actually a diverse group of children with a wide range of needs. Two children with the same type of disability can be affected in very different ways. Some children maybe even have hidden disabilities and it may not be easy, easy to see that they have a disability. So on this slide, we have birth defects. So what are birth defects? These are um, physical abnormalities that are present at the time a child is born. We then have developmental disabilities, which is related to unusual, different, or abnormal functioning uh, for a child um, compared to their chronological age. So the developmental functioning is lower or different from their chronological age. And then there are children who physically are normal, who do not have a developmental problem, but they acquire a disability. And how do they acquire these disabilities? They acquire them because there's some traumatic event, uh, such as they're involved in a motor vehicle accident, or they may have an infection like meningitis, which then gives them a disability. Now, in all of these conditions, there are underlying medical conditions that may affect various activities or domains as they are listed there, on the slide. But the important point is although children with disabilities often have these underlying medical conditions, their disability status alone, meaning that they have a disability, can pose unique and substantial risk related to COVID-19. So what do I mean by that? It's because children with disabilities sometimes have difficulty wearing masks. They sometimes have difficulty with social distancing. They may not comprehend language or directions uh, related to what they're expected to do uh, in order to keep themselves safe. Many children have increased contact with caregivers, aides, and other people in the community who may transmit COVID-19 to them. And then some children are in long-term care facilities or in um, situations where there may be more exposure to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So what is the prevalence of developmental disabilities? How common are developmental disabilities as a group? Next slide. 
So this slide shows that in between 2015 and 2017, about 18% of children had a developmental disability. But what's important about all these bar graphs is beginning in 1997, when the prevalence was about 13%, we see this steady increase in terms of the prevalence of developmental disabilities. So the prevalence or how many children have these disabilities is changing over time. Next slide, please. So if we then look at the prevalence of childhood disabilities, and this time frame is 2009 to 2017, let's look at it by race, because we're really talking about children of color. And these are four important developmental disabilities, developmental disability overall, learning disability, intellectual disability, and cerebral palsy. And if we focus on the blue bar, which represents black children, Oh, previous slide, um, compared to white and Hispanic children, we see that black children have a higher prevalence of all four of these disabilities. Next slide. Next slide. So another way of looking at this is the most recent data that we have on the prevalence of childhood disability was from 2019. And we see that looking at the blue bar that black children, uh, and there are approximately 3 million children in this country with a developmental disability. Black children represent about 5% of that population and white children and Hispanic children represent about 4.3%. Now you're probably wondering about the big orange or brown bar there that's 5.9%. And that represents American Indian and Alaska native children. Their numbers are really small in terms of how many children have a disability. And so we don't have a lot of confidence in the prevalence, uh, but we do have confidence in looking at black children, white children and Hispanic children. And it's very clear that black children have a higher prevalence of developmental disabilities than white and Hispanic children. Next slide, please. So what are increased community challenges faced by children and youth with special health care needs? Next slide. So this is a concept. Some of you may be very familiar with the concept. It's relatively new. It is social determinants of health. And these are conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health risk. And it also affects developmental outcomes. So this is beyond the person. So when we're talking about these conditions, obviously these conditions affect these children, but what we've come to realize is the total social environment in which children live, learn, work and play affects their development. So if we look at the figure, there are five different areas that have been identified that are a part of social determinants of health. The first is neighborhood, um, and the built environment. How many trees are there? What is the um, sort of physical environment that where children live? Health and healthcare, um, that includes access to healthcare. And we know that that is often uh, a problem within our communities. Social and community um, context, and I'd like to point out that discrimination is listed there or racism. And we've come to recognize how that impacts health and development from the standpoint of education, uh, level of education, language and literacy are really important, obviously, to developmental outcomes. And then there's um, economic stability. So looking at poverty, employment, food insecurity, housing insecurity, you may realize that we are discussing these social determinants of health more and more and coming to recognize the importance of the social determinants of health related to not only health, but to development as well. Next slide.
So what is another factor that's really important in terms of developmental outcomes in children? We have recognized for quite some time that the mental health of mothers directly impacts the development of her children. So this is, these are data from a survey where parents were asked about their mental health um, status. And then there was um, a follow-up looking at the children of those parents. And these were children birth to 17 years of age, and it was a national survey. So the, these data are representative of the entire country. Um, what they found in this study was that one in 14 children had at least one caregiver with poor mental health. It's a large number of children, 7.2%. And compared to children with all male caregivers with good mental health, children with any male caregiver with poor mental health were about five times more likely to have poor general health and almost twice as likely to have one or more mental, behavioral, or developmental disabilities. And what was important about these findings is this was looking at the mental health of the father. And very few studies have looked at mental health factors in the father, but we do have a lot of evidence of um, factors related to mental health in the mother and their impact on um, the development of their children. In this study, the findings were similar when looking at mental health of male and female caregivers. Next slide. So we're here to talk about COVID. What do we know about COVID related to the um, African-American community? Well, we know that early in the pandemic, we didn't have good data to really support our anecdotal and information that more Blacks were getting diagnosed with COVID, were being hospitalized, were more severely ill, were admitted to the ICU and we're dying. So here's a slide that um, actually is looking at data from Atlanta and it shows that black patients with COVID-19 were more likely to be hospitalized than white patients. And so that is, those are the bars where it says hospitalized. And we see that um, whites were hospitalized about 13% of the time and blacks were hospitalized about 79% of the time. And that is really striking because we know that the population prevalence of blacks is only 12 to 13% and the population prevalence in whites is more than 60%. So this is really um, an incredible disparity there related to the population prevalence of blacks in general and the percent that were being hospitalized for COVID. Next slide, please. Another important outcome was mortality or deaths. So we see um, two figures here. And the first, if you can just focus on the red bars, that's um, the, um, the information related to the percent of COVID-9 deaths and the blue bar is looking at the population prevalence of that particular racial group. Well, you don't have to really look very hard to see that when we're looking at the non-Hispanic Black population, um, that's the only group where the percent of hospitalizations is disparate to the population prevalence of Blacks in the community. And the difference is about 12 to 13 percent of the population is Black. And this was about 16% of the hospitalizations um, were in Black individuals. The second set of bars is really adjusting this for the different age groups. And we see that there's even an, either, an even greater disparity. And we also note that Hispanics and American Indian uh, Alaska Natives also show this difference in terms of the um, percentage of deaths compared to the population percentage. Next slide, please. So what do we know about children and youth who face challenges in emergencies? And fortunately, at CDC, we have, um, we've been studying the impact of emergencies on children for quite some time, not just infections, but um, 
climate um, changes that produce volcanoes, hurricanes, uh, children who are subjected to um, war, uh, children who are separated from their parents. So we have a lot of information now about the psychological effects on children when they are in these challenging emergency type situations. Um, so what do we know? We know that children are affected by changes in their routines, by breaks in their continuity of learning, by breaks in the continuity of healthcare. Um, they are affected by missed significant life, life events like Christmas, birthdays, uh, other holidays, and there is a sense of loss, security, and safety. Next slide, please. But we know that children with developmental disabilities are particularly vulnerable and have been vulnerable during the COVID-19 pandemic. And some of the reasons are these children have greater healthcare needs. There is greater dependency on community-based services and many of these services no longer exist or they've been closed uh, during the pandemic. And we know there's been the emergency of many more mental health concerns, not just in the children, but in the families as well. Next slide, please. I'm sure that you're all aware that last week, CDC provided guidance related to children safely returning to in-person schools in the fall. And that this is a priority because children benefit from in-person learning and we have a lot of documentation. So we are concerned about the impact of the pandemic on children who have been um, in virtual learning situations only for more than a year. In order to think about how to provide a safe return to school for children with disabilities, we have some recommendations. Provide accommodations, modifications, and assistance for students, teachers, and staff with disabilities and other healthcare needs when implementing the COVID-19 safety protocols. Work with families to better understand the individual needs of students with disabilities. Ensure access to services for students with disabilities and adjust strategies as needed. Now, the guidance that CDC um, shared last week emphasizes implementing a layered prevention strategy approach to protect people who are not fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. So these are the prevention strategies. This is what we mean by a layered approach. So first of all, promoting vaccination. We know that vaccination is our best tool to end the pandemic. We also know that there are recommendations that everyone um, is um, able to receive a vaccination with a very few exceptions. There are rare cases where people, because of medical conditions, cannot be vaccinated, but most people can. And we are, as you know, in the phase of the pandemic where we are really pushing to get as many people vaccinated as possible. What about wearing masks? So another prevention strategy is the consistent and correct mask use. And we know that if you have been vaccinated, that you no longer have to wear a mask in certain situations. However, if you're unvaccinated, you still need to wear a mask. And if you um, are less than two years of age, of course, you do not need to wear a mask. So we're talking about children that are two years and older who are not vaccinated. And we know the vaccine is not available for children uh, under 12 years of age. So the children who are returning to school, many of them will have to wear masks. What about physical distancing? The recommendation is now that the physical distancing um, be enforced and is three feet apart as opposed to the um, previous guidance for six feet apart. Screening, testing, and promptly identifying cases, clusters, and outbreaks is important. Ventilation in, um, in uh, indoor settings is important. Hand washing and respiratory etiquette is, in part, is a part of our prevention strategies, as well as, of course, staying home when sick and getting tested. 
Their contact tracing is important in combination with isolation and quarantine when it's identified that a, a particular person um, is positive for COVID-19, following up with contacts is an important part of our prevention strategy. And of course, cleaning and disinfection remains one of our prevention strategies. Next slide, please. So how can parents help children with disabilities cope? Whether these children are in school or whether they are at home with virtual learning, there are some things that parents can do. First of all, relationships can be strengthened and maintained within the home. Get active together. 30 minutes of rhythmic activity can help calm the brain. Spend some time outside. Routines are something we can control during uncertain times. Make a visible chart or calendar with schedules or things to celebrate together. Pencil in a time for family night. Resilience can help children manage stress and feelings of anxiety. Practice deep breathing and other mindfulness techniques to help with self-soothing. Make a vision or dream board to help with creating goals for the future. Next slide, please. So CDC has some resources that I want to share with you. And I have several slides, but I'm not gonna go into great detail. This is a parental resources kit and it is organized by ages. So for younger children, for school age children, for adolescents and for young adults. And um, these resources are available in English and Spanish. Next slide. CDC, oh, CDC also has a disability toolkit that you will see on the next slide with a number of different um, documents and resources that we hope you will find really helpful. And the um, website is at the bottom of this slide and the slides will be available after the presentation so you can access these resources. Next slide, please. There are resources, general resources that are available, such as caring for children in a disaster, uh, ready Wrigley activity books for children ages three to 10, and there's information about children's mental health. Next slide. These are additional resources that are available. Next slide. In summary, the population of children with developmental disabilities is large, approximately 18% of all children, three to 17 years of age, and this prevalence of disability has increased over time. Black children are disproportionately affected in terms of developmental disabilities compared to their Hispanic and white counterparts. Poor mental health of caregivers adversely affects general health and mental, behavioral, and developmental outcomes of their children. The pandemic, as we've emphasized, has affected all families with children, but especially families with fewer resources and families of children with special health care needs, including those with developmental disabilities. Vaccination is currently the leading public health prevention strategy to end the COVID-19 pandemic, and masks should be worn indoors by all individuals ages two and older who are not fully vaccinated. Parents can help their children cope during the pandemic and resources are available to assist families with coping during the pandemic. Last slide. I'd like to thank um, my co-workers um, at CDC who have assisted with the presentation and the information. And I'd like to thank um, all of the parents who are investing in our future by caring for our children. Last slide, thank you very much. Dr. Yergin, I'll stop. Fantastic presentation. And thank you very much for your time. We do have a couple of questions that have been submitted. So okay. um, I'll, go through the, I'll go through the questions. Um, first question that I do have is, do you find some youth are given the diagnosis but never get second diagnosis that shows improvement? That's a very good question. The question about um, sort of subsequent evaluation and diagnosis after an initial diagnosis, is that the question? So it is required that um, 
if a child is receiving special education services, they are by law to be reevaluated. And I think it's every three years. Uh, so children should have follow-up. They should have a subsequent evaluation to show whether they have made progress or not. And if you have a child and that's not happening, please bring it to the attention of the school system because children do make progress and we need to continue to follow how they're doing. Um, and yes, you can lose a diagnosis. Uh, so that's extremely important. So please follow up with your physician uh, from a medical standpoint and with your school system from an educational standpoint. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Are children with severe allergies considered special health care need children? And does the severity of the allergies have any effect of exposed to COVID? That's a very good question. And we've been looking at information on children uh, with um, chronic health um, conditions. So I think that the answer might be, depending upon how severe the allergy um, is, uh, and um, does the child have other conditions in addition to allergy? We have been asked the question about children who are very allergic uh, receiving the vaccine. And I do want to answer that question because I think it's very important that people know that that is not a contraindication to getting the vaccine, but you should work with your physician uh, in order to determine whether this child who is allergic um, would not qualify for getting the vaccine. Thank you. And uh, we have another question um, that came in the chat. Um, if your child did not do good with virtual class, can they be left back, although normally they do it better in person? Great question. Well, gosh, I'm not an educator. <laughs> and I think you're asking a question that's related to um, sort of an education focus. Um, I don't know. I am very concerned about how much our children have lost from an educational standpoint in the last year. I assume there would be some testing uh, at the beginning of the school year to determine um, where children are. And I know in Atlanta, for example, there's some remediation that's occurring this summer. There are some programs uh, that will hopefully help children catch up. Um, but I can't answer the question of what will happen when school opens and when we are looking at these children and trying to determine where we go from here. That's a, that's a very good point, Dr. Yergin Alsop. Um, not only from an academic standpoint that they're losing, they're losing out on those interpersonal relationships that develop from, from you know, being social activated. So they are losing quite a bit. Um, you know, with that, that um, being home and virtual. I mean, again, like I mentioned earlier, I know your door that, that was virtual pro over a year. And um, I could definitely see a difference from her demeanor from when she was going to school every day and, and getting that, you know, that, that social interaction with her classmates versus just sitting in front of a computer all day. So, so definitely let me, um, so um, there are no additional questions, but I do have a question. Um, okay. You know, one of, one of the things that, um, you know, the fraternity catalog that we focus on is SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. And I know the CDC is big on SIDS as well. And I know you discussed, you, you mentioned the mental health of the caregivers. Is there any correlation between SIDS and mental health of the parents, the mother and the father, that may very well be a correlation or a tie between the numbers that affect African-American, Hispanics, and so on? I'm not aware of any studies. That's a, an excellent question. So I can't really answer that intelligently. So I'm not aware. Um, there may be some studies that have looked at that. But again, I think it's important that we are now thinking more and more about the mental health of parents and how that does affect their children. And you saw from the data I presented, it's not just developmental outcomes in children, it's overall health. And so um, we do have screening now. I'm a pediatrician, as 
you noted. Uh, and we do have screening for maternal depression as part of well child care, which I think is extremely important so that then there can be appropriate referrals so that these moms, and now we see that dads also uh, have mental health issues that affect their children. I'm glad we are equal opportunity here and we're focusing on dads as well. Um, but I think it's extremely important that we identify this and that we know that there is a relationship between the parent's mental health and the overall health of the child, as well as their mental behavioral and developmental outcomes. Absolutely, well said. But again, thank you very much for the presentation that you've submitted. And I wanna also thank each and every one that has attended this presentation. Um, right now, this will conclude our presentation. We look forward to you reviewing it and, and please continue to spread the information and pass along the uh, information for others to record, uh, watch the recording. Thank you and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you. The presentation will be available. So all that list of resources, I do hope that you will take advantage of that. Thank you. Absolutely.